Due to the graphic nature of this case, listener discretion is advised. This episode includes dramatizations and discussions of incest, violence, and killing. We advise extreme caution for children under 13. On the morning of February 1st, 1966, a golden Cadillac pulled up outside the Dade County Courthouse in Miami, Florida. A woman emerged. She was the image of luxury. Pearls, diamonds, a gorgeous gown, and platinum blonde hair that made the Cadillac look dull. As she made her way to the door, people shouted her name and pushed each other just to get a glance. Some even asked for an autograph. To passers-by, it must have been a puzzling scene. It resembled a Hollywood premiere more than anything one would expect to see outside of a courthouse. Even more puzzling, this radiant woman, Candace, or as she preferred, Candy Mossler, would be the one standing trial. And it was for no petty crime. She was being prosecuted for the death of her wealthy husband, Jacques Mossler. Jacques' body was found in his Miami home two years prior, and Candy was the prime suspect. Her alleged co-conspirator was 24-year-old Melvin Powers, who also happened to be her nephew. And if that wasn't salacious enough, she'd also been having an affair with him. And yet the crowd still showered Candy with adoration. Even though she was an alleged murderer indulging in an incestuous and adulterous relationship, Her southern charm proved unstoppable. And while her charisma worked on the people outside the courtroom, the jury inside would be less easy to win over. The killer of Jacques Masler and the subsequent trial grabbed the nation's attention in 1966 and held on to it for three long weeks. With each day, more and more scandalous details emerged that turned this murder case into one of the most publicized, sensationalized crimes of the 1960s. This is our one-part episode on the killing of Jacques Mosler, the entrepreneur who built an empire with his wife, Candy. And while the two were an unbeatable duo in their prime, it didn't last that way for long. Many believe that Candy was the mastermind behind Jacques' gruesome death. We have all that and more coming up. Stay with us. Jacques Masler was born on May 5, 1895 in Romania. As a child, his family immigrated to America in search of a more prosperous life. They settled into a poor neighborhood in Chicago, but everything changed in 1908. His father died suddenly. As the oldest son, Jacques needed to step in and take care of his siblings and mother. He immediately rose to the occasion by dropping out of school and picking up work as a newsie. The new job was lucrative, but not quite enough. He needed to develop a side hustle. Want to grab a shake? I would, but my mom says we can't afford allowance anymore. I can help you out. You'd have to pay me back, but I could spot you this time around. Again? Wow, thanks so much. Well, here's the thing. Consider last week on me. But this time around, every extra day you take to pay me back, it'll be an extra dime tacked on. That's only fair, right? Uh, I guess. Shake on it. The young loan shark was able to bring in just enough money to put food on the table for himself and his brothers. While most kids his age spent their time playing with friends or chasing girls, Jacques took great pleasure in hard work. But it wasn't just the work he enjoyed. It was the ability to truly take care of and support his loved ones. He felt like he had some real purpose. So he doubled down and accomplished more than ever before. Jacques' drive and passion eventually led him to a job in the finance department of a car dealership by the time he was 25 years old. It was 1920, and cars had just entered the consumer market. They were all the rage. The timing could not have been more perfect. While at the dealership, something occurred to Jacques. More people wanted a car than could actually afford one. 
Suddenly, he remembered his old schoolyard scheme, lending money and cashing in on the interest. Now he wouldn't be playing with nickels and dimes, but thousands of dollars. If there was ever someone perfectly poised to dive headfirst into the credit business, it was Jacques. By the mid-1930s, he'd founded the Mossler Acceptance Corporation, which offered installment loans to families and businesses. It was an instant success. By the end of World War II, Jacques had expanded his corporation into 40 different banking, insurance, and finance firms. Soldiers were returning in droves, all in dire need of credit to start their new lives. Business was booming. And while lending money to veterans sounds noble on paper, Jacques' business practices weren't exactly ethical. His lending firms would give a loan to just about anyone who asked and tack on astronomical interest rates. Many of the things he helped people afford, he would later have a hand in repossessing. Along the way, Jacques married his longtime girlfriend, Evelyn, and had four daughters. After years of marital trouble, the two moved to New Orleans, hoping for a fresh start, but Jacques was simply too consumed by his work. The marriage fell apart, and the couple divorced in 1947. A year later, the newly single Jacques Mosler was sitting in his office when he heard a knock at his door. He had no way of knowing, but this visit would change his life completely. Yes, come in. <laughs> Hello there, Mr. Mosler. My name is Candace Weatherby. But please, you can just call me Candy. Candy, how charming. Please, take a seat. What can I help you with today? I'm with the New Orleans Grand Opera. I'm raising money for... Now, wait just a minute. I talked with your people not two days ago. I already pledged $25. Well, that's why I'm here. Now, Mr. Mossler, you're a man of means. Everyone in town knows it. In fact, just about everyone in town knows an awful lot about you. And they know you're about as swell as they come. And just about every time I bring your name up, everyone just lights up. I can tell you have a big heart. And I think you love this city just as much as I do. <laughs> all right, all right. You could stop the pitch. You made your point. I see where this is going. How much do you need? I'm sure something more along the lines of 350 couldn't hurt. <laughs> if you'll have dinner with me tonight, consider it a deal. You have yourself a deal. <laughs> 53-year-old Jacques had never met anyone like her in his entire life. 28-year-old Candy was no taller than five feet, but her presence filled up the whole room. And the way she upsold him on the donation? It was artful. Jacques almost felt like he'd been bested. He had finally met his match. He didn't know it at the time, but Candy's life wasn't so different from his own. She was also born into poverty and grew up on a farm in Buchanan, Georgia, with 12 other siblings. She dropped out of school, got married, and had two children. But after a few years, she realized it was time for a change. Candy got divorced and headed straight to New York City with her kids. She quickly landed work as a model, but something still didn't feel right. Not only was the big city not the right place to raise a family, but modeling didn't suit her at all. Sure, she was beautiful, but she wanted more. She relocated to New Orleans and opened up her own modeling agency. It was an instant success. Her experience as a model made her a perfect teacher for young women looking to follow in her footsteps. As her empire slowly began to grow, she became a pillar of the New Orleans social scene. By the time Candy was 28 years old, it seemed like she had it all, but there was a crucial component missing. For as beautiful and charming as she was, she had trouble finding someone to settle down with. But once she met Jacques Mosler, everything changed. After that fateful day in Jacques' office, the two fell madly in love. The two got married only six months after they met on May 24, 1949. The couple, along with their six children, moved into a 28-room mansion in the exclusive River Oaks neighborhood in Houston, Texas. The palace-like home also served as the headquarters for Jacques' business. 
For the first few years of the marriage, Candy was treated like royalty. Jacques showered her in jewelry, furs, and a walk-in closet filled with designer clothing. But Candy Mosler was no housewife. She sat on the board of directors for Jacques' company and was involved with just about every institution and charity in Houston. Jacques and Candy felt like their lives might be this sweet forever. But things began to go downhill in 1961. It all started with a phone call from Candy's sister, Elizabeth. Mosler household, this is Candy speaking. It's me, Elizabeth. Hun, what is it? Talk to me. Mel, it's Mel. My favorite nephew? What's wrong? He went to jail, Candy. It's those new friends of his. They're a bunch of hoodlums. You know what a good kid he is. He wouldn't hurt a fly. But he won't listen to me. He just won't. Oh, sweetie, we're going to figure this out, I promise. You gotta help. Me and Gary, we just can't keep doing this anymore. We're barely holding it together ourselves. Do you think he could maybe come and stay with you and Jacques? He gets out in a month. He just needs some structure, some good influence. You two could set him straight. He's family, of course. The only thing that Jacques cared about more than growing his business was keeping his wife happy. And when Candy first told him about her beloved nephew, he could tell how much he meant to her. So in late 1961, the strikingly handsome Melvin Lane Powers arrived at the Mosler mansion. Jacques set him up with a job and gave him a room in their home. Melvin, who liked to be called Mel, was only 17 years old at the time, but his linebacker physique and mature demeanor could easily have someone thinking he was well into his late 20s. Pretty soon, it was not uncommon to see Candy out on the town with Mel on her arm. She dressed him in designer suits and introduced him to Houston's elite. And while Candy seemed quite content with the situation, everyone around her couldn't help but tilt their heads when the two walked by. They seemed to be getting a bit too close to one another. By 1963, the servants were murmuring to one another more than usual. Whenever Jacques would look over to them, they'd stop suddenly and scatter. None of them could maintain eye contact with him for more than a few seconds. Eventually, he cornered a maid and got to the bottom of things. Would you care to tell me why I feel like a stranger in my own house? I don't know what you could possibly be talking about. Oh, please. Out with it. Come on. This isn't easy to say, but, well, me and some of the other girls, we walked in on Ms. Mosler and Mel... That's insane. He's her nephew. That's impossible. I'm sorry, sir. I don't know what to say. I didn't want to believe it, but then it happened again and again. It doesn't seem like they're even trying to hide it. Back to work. At once. Not another word of this. Jacques spun out into a rage. He ran into his bedroom and flung open dresser after dresser until he found her diary. He tore through the small leather-bound journal. His heart sank when he found an astonishing entry. It's all happened so fast, but Mel is the true love of my life. I've never felt like this before. He's everything I've ever wanted in a man, and I know it's taboo. I know that society will frown upon it, but I can't deny it. He's the man of my dreams. Coming up, Jacques Mosler's life falls apart, while Candy's is just getting started. In 1961, 68-year-old Jacques Mosler accepted 17-year-old Mel Powers into his home. Mel was his wife's nephew, and the young man needed a fresh start. A natural caretaker, Jacques was happy to lend a hand. However, in 1963, he discovered that his wife, Candy, had been engaging in a romantic affair with her young nephew. Not only was the relationship adulterous, it was incestuous. Jacques was furious. He headed straight to his lawyer for advice. 
This is a mess. An absolute mess. Get the divorce paper started immediately. I want that woman out of my life. And that boy, I want him in jail now. Jack, just wait a second. I know you're upset, but it's not that simple. What do you mean? It's the most simple thing in the world as far as I'm concerned. If the media catches wind of this, you are absolutely screwed. This will be your legacy. Is that what you want? It's all anyone in town will be talking about. Candy will make sure of it. <sighs> You're right. You need to do this as quietly as possible. I'm sure word will spread. It always does in Houston. But don't make it any worse than it needs to be. So in lieu of filing for divorce, Jacques had Mel fired from the company and evicted from his mansion. The same night that he was evicted, there was a banging on the Mossler doors. Hello? Who's out there? Mel? I swear you all, Pig, you will regret this. I will make you regret this for the rest of my life. You'll be dragged out of here in handcuffs. I can smell the liquor on your breath, you stupid child. I am going to destroy you, old man. Mel didn't return to the mansion after that night, but the situation was far from resolved. Jacques felt too ashamed to show his face in Houston, so he fled to Florida. Meanwhile, Mel and Candy doubled down. They flaunted their love and openly displayed affection at events and parties downtown. But even though the love between Jacques and Candy was gone, they didn't get divorced. For Candy, it made a lot of sense. If she filed for divorce, she'd likely receive $200,000. But if she could force Jacques to file himself, she'd receive half of his estate, which amounted to about $33 million. Jacques, on the other hand, wanted to avoid Candy as much as humanly possible. After learning of the affair, he took up residence in Miami. He desperately wanted to leave the entire debacle behind and focus on growing his business. For a while, Jacques' plan seemed to be working out. He ran his business from Florida, and Candy was able to devote herself to her nephew-turned-lover back in Houston. But then, in the summer of 1964, Candy made an unexpected phone call to Jacques. Mr. Mossler, I presume. What is it, Candace? You're not happy to hear from me? No. How are you doing? How is my lovely wife handling the home all on her own? Has Mel moved on to a different aunt? Don't be cruel. Listen, I was thinking, it's been so horribly hot here in Houston. The kids could use a little splashing around, and I could certainly use a nice cocktail by the pool. How about we spend some time with you down in Key Biscayne? After a year of radio silence, having to beg just to speak with my daughter on the phone, you want to come visit? Oh, you've always been so dramatic. Neither of us have been ourselves this past year. Consider this a peace summit. Come on, you know it'll be a blast. Jacques, are are you there? Yeah, I'm here. I'll think about it. In June, Candy and the children arrived in Miami. At first, the two got along, and they peacefully coexisted for the first time in close to a year. They'd take trips to the beach and laugh together over luxurious meals. It seemed like the spark might even reignite between Candy and Jacques. But in the midst of what felt like a fairy tale, disaster struck. On the night of June 24, 1964, Candy began complaining of migraines so debilitating that she could hardly function. Jacques was no stranger to his wife's theatrics, so he told her to take it easy and spend a few afternoons out of the sun. But with each passing day, it seemed like her headaches were only getting worse. Things reached their apex on the night of June 29th. Candy! Candy, are you all right? My God, it's just these... Is my grains... I'm going in and out, Jock. I need help. Let me get the doctor on the phone. He'll be right over. No, 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 no. I, I should really go to the emergency room. They're much better suited for these things. This really is an emergency, after all. 
All right, get your things. I'll drive you. Oh, no, I wouldn't want to put you out. You're all ready for bed, and I know you've been working so hard. You know what? I think the worst of it is passing. I can drive myself just fine. You were just on the floor, and now you want to drive yourself to the hospital? What, because I'm a woman, you think I shouldn't go behind the wheel of a car? What? When did I- Honey, you're clearly stressed. You know what? Let me give you the house to yourself for a few hours. I, I'm sure you could use the alone time. I'll take the kids with me. The kids? Why on earth would you bring the kids to the hospital? And not another word about it, mister. That's final. I want you to put on something comfy, get in that king-size bed, and have some real peace and quiet before you're the one with the migraine. The whole situation was bizarre. Candy had never turned down a house call before, and bringing the kids to the emergency room at one in the morning made no sense. It perplexed Jacques to no end, but so did just about everything Candy did. He shrugged it off. However, as the night went on, things only got stranger. Jacques' neighbors awoke at 1.30 a.m. to the sounds of grunting, muffled screaming, and Jacques' dog barking like crazy. It sounded so troubling that the neighbors felt compelled to go see if everything was all right. Jacques? Is everything okay in there? Okay, well, if you need anything, anything at all, please just let us know. Three hours later, Candy returned home. When she opened the door, Jacques' body lay splayed out in the living room, his head caved in and his chest nearly torn open from almost 40 stab wounds. When the police arrived at 5 a.m., they couldn't help but notice how calm Candy seemed. Perhaps she was in shock, but still, something felt off. They took her down to the station. So, Miss Mossler, do you have any idea why this might have happened to your husband? I have my theories, as I'm sure you do as well. I have reason to believe that my husband has taken a number of suitors. Men, if that makes any difference to you. And you think... I think there was some sort of heated argument, perhaps about me, likely about me, regarding Jacques' persisting love for me and his jealousy which likely stirred up some jealousy in the male suitor, and, well, we all know how these things go. Do we now? How do these things go, Miss Mossler? Well, things clearly escalated. Poor shock. Candy's seemingly rehearsed story didn't convince the detectives. If anything, it just made her seem more suspicious. And as the investigation continued, more and more signs pointed to Candy. A car was found in the parking lot of the Miami airport that was registered in Candy's name. Inside, they found splotches of blood and fingerprints that matched ones that were lifted from the crime scene. But these fingerprints weren't Candy's. At first, the cops were baffled. But after interviewing a few other people, it all seemed to click together. A name kept coming up. Some kid who had been kicked out of Jacques' Houston mansion just a year earlier. His name was Melvin Powers, Candy's lover and nephew. And after some digging around, the police found out that he had purchased a one-way flight out of Miami just hours after Jacques' body was found. The detectives flew out to Houston and got a warrant to search Mel's home and belongings. His prints matched both those found at the crime scene and in the car parked at the airport. They also found blood on the clothing he wore the night he flew back from Miami. The blood was a direct match with Jacques. On July 3rd, 1964, 22-year-old Mel Powers was arrested and charged with the murder of Jacques Mossler. The police and just about everyone who was involved with the case figured this would be a quick one. With this much physical and circumstantial evidence, Mel would be locked up for the rest of his life in no time. But they had no idea what they were in for. Coming up, Candy and Mel stand trial for the murder of Jacques Mossler. 
And now back to the story. In July of 1964, 22-year-old Melvin Powers was arrested for the killing of 69-year-old Jacques Mosler. As soon as Candy Mosler heard that her beloved nephew was in police custody, she got in touch with criminal defense lawyer Percy Foreman. Foreman was notorious for his courtroom theatrics and uncanny ability to get high-profile criminals out of sticky situations. But even for him, this case was quite shocking. He needed $200,000 up front to start working on Mel's defense. The Mosler bank account was frozen after Jacques' death, so Candy couldn't use it. But she thought of an alternative. The 44-year-old widow invited Foreman to the mansion and allowed him to raid her fur and jewelry collection to his heart's content. The eccentric lawyer found this form of payment perfectly suitable. While Candy was helping Mel build a robust legal team, the police continued to investigate the killing. After a series of interviews and anonymous tips, they were pointed in the direction of two Miami-based ex-cons who seemed to have pertinent information. So how do you know the Mosslers? Well, we were drinking where we go to drink every night. Louis just east of Little Havana, and this woman comes up to us. She looked like Marilyn Monroe, but she talked with a southern accent. She buys us each drink and tells us she needs help with a very sensitive issue. Said it involved her husband or something. We knew what she meant. She pulled out a checkbook and writes a check for ten grand. Says if we took care of her problem, the money was ours. A few days later, another man came forward. His story was about how Candy approached him, promising thousands of dollars to kill Jacques. Of course, this evidence was purely circumstantial, but still, things were not looking good for Candy and Mel. And as time went on... Candy became the prime suspect in the killing of Jacques Mosler. On July 5, 1965, 45-year-old Candace Mosler was indicted. She received a phone call from her lawyer. Candy, it's time. Just like that, we're not even going to put up a fight? There will be plenty of time to fight. But right now, it's better to go with Grace than to be dragged kicking and screaming. Trust me. Are they going to put me in jail? Yes, honey, but we'll get you out. You're strong. You can do this. Right now, it's all about how it looks. There's a flight from Houston to Miami tomorrow morning. All right, but you better get me out of that jail, Percy, or else you're giving me back my furs. For most people, going to jail after being accused of murder would be shameful and certainly not something to draw attention to. But Candy Mosler was not most people. She alerted the media, and when she arrived at the Miami police station, an army of reporters and photographers were standing by. She arrived dressed for a night of champagne and lobster tails, but was forced to trade in her designer gown for a prison jumpsuit. She spent 14 days at the Dade County Prison. When she was finally able to post bail, the cameras returned, and her exit from prison was worthy of a standing ovation. She shook hands, gave interviews, and blew kisses to the other inmates. The trial began on January 17, 1966. Candy Mosler and Mel Powers were both being tried for the murder of Jacques Mosler. The press couldn't resist the story. The combination of death, mystery, and incestuous romance amongst Houston's elite was like catnip to them. But the resulting circus overshadowed the very real, tragic nature of the situation. The public followed the media's lead and swarmed the courthouse. The case was so salacious that anyone under the age of 21 was turned away at the door. Candy managed to charm the crowd, but she didn't have such good luck with the prosecution. Her alibi hadn't changed, and she still claimed that since she was at the hospital from 1 a.m. to 4 a.m. the night of Jacques' killing, she couldn't have been involved. But someone of Candy's means could have easily called a private physician for a house call, which is something she did frequently, and she could provide no explanation for bringing her children along for the ride. It seemed clear that she knew the killing was going to happen and needed to make sure she wasn't in the apartment. 
But the prosecution spent most of the trial focusing on the evidence that implicated her nephew, Mel. Specifically, his fingerprints at the scene of the crime, his blood-stained clothes, and his plane ticket that he purchased the night of Jacques' killing. It was also later discovered there had been an eyewitness who spotted Mel at a bar just a short drive from Jacques' home. It was a strong case. There was no denying it. But Percy Foreman was a bulldog in the courtroom, and this trial was no exception. He pointed out that, yes, Mel's prints were lifted from the crime scene. However, there were 30 other unique sets of prints found in the room where Jacques was killed. This threw the prosecution for a loop, and it ended up being devastating. The jury slowly started leaning in Candy and Mel's favor. Candy spent a lot of time on the stand, and each time she spoke, her sheer charisma seemed to sway them even more. Then the prosecution made a key mistake. They called the convicted felons who had reportedly been contacted to murder Jacques. These were not exactly the most trustworthy witnesses, especially when compared to the defense's well-groomed, wealthy ones. The ex-con's testimonies were profane and often incomprehensible. One man even went off on a tangent about injecting drugs into his genitals. It was a complete disaster. Defense attorney Percy Foreman noticed this and realized it was time to move in for the final strike. He knew that if he opted to call no more witnesses to the stand, Florida law dictated that he'd get the final closing argument. The defense resting its case early may have looked like defeat, but now one of the country's most well-versed and persuasive criminal defense attorneys would be delivering the final words to the jury on Candy and Mel's behalf. Just about everyone in the courtroom knew exactly how this was going to pan out. And while it did take four long days for the jury to come to a consensus, they reached a verdict. Not guilty. The courtroom erupted in applause. Candy went up to every man on the jury and gave them each a kiss. Mel and Candy burst from the courtroom and shared a long embrace that made flashbulbs fire off like a fireworks display. The media frenzy carried on for weeks after the trial, following up with Candy and Mel as if they were hot new celebrities. Almost none of the resulting articles lamented the death of Jacques Mosler. In fact, the scandalous nature of the case seemed to overshadow the fact that a man had been killed. It also overshadowed the true nature of the relationship between Candy and Mel. A grown woman had taken advantage of her young nephew for years, using wealth and power to keep him in her thrall. Unsurprisingly, the affair didn't last long after the trial ended. The two broke it off in late 1966. Mel eventually settled down with someone his own age and became a real estate developer. Candy inherited the Mosler fortune and took over the business. In the following years, she managed to become quite the entrepreneur herself, tripling the estate. By 1976, it was worth more than $100 million. However, that same year, she died in her sleep after an apparent overdose of migraine medication. Some believe that this was no mistake. There were murmurs that guilt had begun to consume her, and she took her own life. And while the death of Jacques Mosler remains an open case, most familiar or involved with the case believe that Melvin Powers murdered Jacques under the instruction of Candace Mosler. The presence of Mel's fingerprints at both the crime scene, as well as Candy's car at the Miami airport, makes this a clear-cut case. The defense lawyer, Percy Foreman, argued that the other fingerprints at the scene exonerated Mel, but Mel's fingerprints were the only ones that were out of place. After all, Mel had never officially been inside Jacques' Miami home. Ultimately, this case is an example of just how much public image and media frenzy can distort the fair distribution of justice. The story of Candy and her nephew turned lover is still remembered in vivid and scandalous detail by the people of Miami and Houston. But there has been little done to preserve the memory of Jacques Mosler. 
He was a man who went from being a poor Romanian immigrant to one of the world's most successful financial leaders entirely on his own. Jacques was far from perfect, but still, at the heart of this story is a man whose life was unfairly taken away from him. Regardless of who was responsible, the ones he worked so hard to support ultimately flourished because of his death. And that is an injustice that can never be corrected. <laughs> 